60% have less than $1,000 in savings. And this is, these are some of the problems. And when I say we have abundance, this is part of the abundance uh, 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 that we have been demonstrating. We've been spending everything that we have. And it's not just black people. It's not just black people. But we got to change. The, where the disparity should be is the disparity should be between the believers and the non-believers. And if the believers are doing the same thing that the non-believers are doing, then how can God get the glory? How does it look like we're shining? How does it look like God is blessing us any more than the world? So I'm going to touch on four biblical famines because we've had famines before. I'm going to go over the first two tonight, and then I'm going to go over the, the next two uh, next Tuesday. The first one is in Genesis 41. You had uh, the famine was in Egypt. God used Joseph and the attributes, the lessons from that famine were to save. The second one was in 1 Kings 18. Uh, it occurred in Israel. God used Elijah, and the attribute or the lesson was to serve God. We had the third one was the third one was in uh, 2 Kings 6 and 7, and the, the, uh, it was famine and it was a war. And God used Elisha, and the attribute was that we need to end self-reliance and depend on God. And then the last one was in Acts 11. These are four biblical uh, uh, famines. Uh, we had the early church. Um, God used Agabus, and the attributes was to serve others. So we're going to get to the first two today. See, we got to be the salt of the earth. If the world is struggling financially and God's people are not, they will begin to wonder why. Why are we struggling and why aren't the Christians struggling? Why aren't the believers struggling? And the door will be opened up for us to share Christ with them. So <clears throat> what's happening in the market right now? There's a lot of things happening right now. Um, if you look at what's going on with the market, from March 31st, 2010, all the way to March 31st, 2020, the market has averaged 10.53%. And then we've just now had a significant dip. But this is not, this is not out of the ordinary. We've had these uh, types of dips before. So today I'm gonna go over a couple of things, current shocks and uh, a historical perspective what's going on on our heads and what should be going on in our heads and living with market volatility. I'm probably not gonna get to everything, but I'm gonna get to as much. So the first thing I want you to look at is what's happened in the S&P from January 30th, 1970 to March 31st, 2020. Now, when we look at the bear and the bull markets, now we all want what? Bull markets, nobody wants a bear market. So let's look at the bear markets first. So we have, in that time period, we have one, two, three, four bear markets. In 73, the market was down 73, uh, uh, 43%, 87, negative 30, 02, negative 47, uh, 08, negative 55, and 2019, it was down uh, negative 34. But I want you to look at it. See, if you zero in on that, then your focus will be in the wrong place. But when you look at the bull, when you add the bull markets, the bull markets are much longer. The first bull market was three years, six months. <coughs> the second one from, uh, from 74 to like uh, 80, 87 was, eight, was 13 year bull market. Then we had a 12 year bull market, a five year bull market, and then a 10 year bull market. And then we, from, from March 23rd to uh, March 31st, we were up 16%. So what we have to do, we can't just look at what the, the, what's happening right now. We got to look at it from a bigger perspective. Because when you look at the average bull market, it's been seven years, four months. The average bear market has been only been 13 months. And we got people that get scared and they make decisions 
okay, to pull out, to pull out one of the, I keep getting phone calls over and over. I, I just got a phone call before I got here. Elder Kenny, should I take my money? The market is down. No, you don't take your money. Remember, investments make money three different ways. They make money with capital gains, uh, dividends, and sh share price appreciation. That's three ways that elder uh, that uh, e e equities make money. If you take your money out because of the share price being down, then you're going to turn a paper loss into a real loss. It's only a paper loss right now. But if you sell those shares while your money is by the market is down, you're going to liquidate those shares at a lower price than you bought them for. And when you liquidate them for a lower price than you bought them for, then you are going to create a real tangible monetary loss. So we don't want to do that. When you look at market declines, okay, they're going to come. That's why our that's why we should be focused on uh, having having a little faith. God instituted all of these things. <coughs> the S and P over the last fifty years. When you look at, we've had negative five. Okay, the average frequency we have a, a, a decline of negative five percent or more is every ten months. Ne at minus ten percent every two years, 15% or more every four years. And when the market dips lower than 20% every eight years, this is history. Okay, so it's gonna happen. But what we do is if you are older and you're closer to retirement, you and your advisor should be sitting down and your advisor should be shifting you to a safer position as you get closer to retirement. And if they're not, then maybe you want to look at another advisor. So we've rebounded from these viral outbreaks in the past. What do I want to do? What am I here to do today is to encourage you. I want to encourage you. God is still in control. Look, we had SARS in 03, swine flu, 09, Ebola in 014, Zika a couple of years ago, and now we got COVID. And we will rebound from this too. God is going to get us through. But we don't want to make poor decisions that end up bringing. If you had a balance in your 401k <coughs> of 150000 right now it's probably down to maybe one, 133 something like that. You don't want to sell that right now um, and take that money because then your money will really be 133 which is why I'm really against what Trump is telling people to do. So he's telling you that you can take your money out and you can have three years to pay it back up to 100000 Yeah, you can. And that's good. And you won't get penalized if you take put the money back. Now, if you are in dire straits and that's something that, uh, you know, you have no other area to go, then you have no choice but to do that. But if you do have options, then you don't want to do that. Because even if you put the money back, you're probably going to be bought, putting it back and buying at a higher price. So you're still going to turn a paper loss into a real loss. You're going to re really lose money if you pull that money out and liquidate. So a couple of other options. If you have a pension, I would rather see you take a pension loan, okay, and pay that money back to your pension than to pull out of your 401k or your uh, uh, IRAs and retirement accounts and things of that nature. Markets, they come back. They come back. I want you to look at this. When we had the SARS, SARS, the, the point of the start of global interest was 03. And the peak was uh, uh, April of 03. From, st from start to peak, the market was down negative eight. One month after the peak, it was back to 14%. Three months after the peak, it was back up 30%. Swine flu, uh, from start to the peak, negative nine. One month after the peak, is up 9%. Three months after the peak, is up 17%. Ebola, down in Africa, start the peak, it was down negative four. One month after six, three months after seven. 
We got to, where's our faith? We got to have some faith in the institutions that God has put in. And if you have money, now is the perfect time to buy. The, the market high was at uh, February 12th. The market was at 29,000. Today, the market has a, is at the uh, S&P, uh, the Dow is at uh, 24,000 it closed today. I've been doing nothing but buying. I've been buying, 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 buying. Why? Because market's going to come back. Uh, and listen, the government's not going to let the cruise line go out of business. They're not going to let the airlines go out of business. Those shares are down right now. You can buy those shares. The object of investing is to buy low and sell high. Look at this. We got to remember, okay? We got to look at history. So what's going on in your head? <clears throat> Before I start with this, I want to go over the, the first economic, uh, the first economic uh, biblical um, crisis. So in Egypt, in Egypt, we know that there's a couple of when the, when the Israelites were in Egypt, there uh, we know Joseph delivered them, but there's there's a couple of lessons that I want you to think about from there. So the first major lesson that I want you to learn from Joseph and the, uh, uh, the Israelites in Egypt is that in that particular famine, the government did the savings, not the people. The government did the saving. It was the government savings program. Now, the Bible tells us to put money away. The Bible tells us, the individuals, but the government did that. So we know Joseph was used by God to lead the government to prepare because the people did not prepare for their own survival. And that's what's happening right now. We got people who are in trouble because they did not prepare for their own survival. So what we need to do is we need to learn from the past. We need to learn from the Bible. And we need to begin to prepare ourselves. We need to stop indulging and just spending money frivolously on things that we don't need. For those of you who have known me for a long time, I've preached this over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to preach it till the Lord takes my breath. We, have to, we should be saving or saving at least 10% of our income. A good way to go is you give God his 10%, you give you your 10%, and you live on 80%. And you'll never get out of being trouble financially. You'll never be broke. <coughs> A second lesson to learn from the first biblical famine is that the government didn't give them the grain. The government did not give them the grain. It's it, the government of Egypt sold the grain back to them. See, this is significant. Because Joseph's plan wasn't a, uh, wasn't a welfare plan. It wasn't a stimulus plan. Gimme, 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 gimme. I've never seen anything like it. Gimme, 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 gimme. That's not biblical. David said, I would not offer up to God that which cost me nothing. We want to spend all we want, and then we want the government to take care of us, and it's not biblical. The government, even under Joseph's direction, still took everything the people had in the midst of their suffering. Now, Joseph reduced the people of Egypt to servitude. Imagine what this government would do. This government is not a godly man, that is not being led by a godly man like, jo like Joseph. One more lesson. A third lesson we can glean from the story of Joseph is when he was put in charge, Joseph began a seven-year preparation and anticipation of that crisis. God warned him. See, that's important. Now, if you got stung this time, the next time we have an economic crisis, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get stung. The Bible says the prudent see danger and they act accordingly. So three lessons coming from that first, uh, first uh, biblical uh, uh, famine, pardon, So what's going on in our heads? What are we thinking about? What are you thinking about? See, 
there's a couple of things that we need to be thinking about. Number one, growing wealth. Growing wealth. I teach this every time I do anything because it's so important. Everybody needs to know this rule. The rule of 72 is a fundamental rule about money that tells people how long it takes your money to double. And if you got your money sitting in an account in the bank at 1% or 3%, then your money's never going to double. Right now, banks are giving us 1%. So if you take 72 divided by 1, then 72 divided by 1 is 72. So that's how many years it'll take your money to double. At 3%, 72 divided by 3 means your money will double every 24 years. And this is one of the reasons why we can't accumulate anything because we got Christians who are supposed to have ultimate faith afraid to put their money in the market. And they sit on the sidelines and they preach faith from the pulpit, but they won't take any action. And we can't grow wealth that way. If God is providing for people that don't believe like him, then why would he let us put our money in there and just fail tremendously? Now, of course, you got to do some diligence. And if you don't know how to do the diligence, then you get with somebody like me and let me teach you. Because the average equity has averaged at least 10% since 1934. You take 72 divided by 12, and now the money doubles every six years. A one-time $10,000 investment over a 40-year year period grows to $2.5 million. But you, there's a, there's a, there's a quote that, uh, that I've read. It says, a rising tide raises all ships. But that's not true. A rising tide raises all ships that are in the boat, that are in the water, rather. Raises all ships and boats that are in the water. And if you're not in the water because you're afraid, you're never going to grow any wealth. And if you can't grow any wealth, then you can't give. And if you can't give, then we can't do ministry. The second thing we should be thinking about, and this is important, is that many people, we had 27 million of people file for unemployment. <coughs> 27 million in like three weeks. So that means what? Their benefits are gone. Most, uh, most people don't have life insurance outside the job. So if you don't have life insurance outside the job, then what? You have you pass away and then you leave your leave your family a burden? That's not biblical. First Timothy 5 and 8 says, whoever doesn't provide for their own, and especially their own household, they have denied the faith and is worse than the unbeliever. So let's say I had a magical toaster, and on the first and the 15th, two thousand dollars popped up out of that toaster. You would like that toaster, and you would insure that toaster because you want that $2,000 to keep coming. But there's no such magic, magical toaster. You are the magical toaster. You are the money machine for your family. And if something happened to you, how would your family be? Right now, we got a husband, we got a wife. They both make $3,500 a month in income. $7,000 in income, $7,000 in bills. And then the Lord takes him home. Christian people do die. We seen, I've seen a lot of Christian people die during this COVID. I paid at least about four death claims. Four of my clients have passed. So now he dies and he leaves his wife no life insurance. How in the world is she going to pay $7,000 in bills with only $3,500 a month in income? She can't do it. So now she's in trouble and he's out of the will of God. But what if I had this guy insured for 350000 and I took that three fifty dollars and I invested it for her at 10%. 10% of 350000 is 35000 a year in interest income. So now I at least have some kind of structure in place. And we know the market is up, the market is down. When the market is down, she has to take less money. When the market is up, she can take more. But I got a structure in place to replace his income. And that's what life insurance is for. And if you only had it on the job, you need to be thinking about getting yourself a little life insurance just in case something happens to you. Just in case your family, uh, 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 something happens to you, you so your family's not left high and dry. 
So with life insurance, there are two options. One is a lot more expensive. So, uh, and I don't uh, agree with it at all. I think whole life uh, policies are uh, one of the biggest ripoffs in the insurance industry. So instead of buying a whole life policy where you're paying 295 a month for 150,000 on you and your husband, and the cash value growing to 124,000. If you buy a term policy, you can use get 400,000 a piece for 126 dollars a month. Then you take the savings, 295 minus 126 is 169. You take the 169 and invest that at nine percent. Okay, over that 35 year period, you have half a million dollars. This is one of the things that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about why. Because right now, you might have some children. You might have some debt. You might have a mortgage. And if something were to happen to you, the loss of your income would be devastating. But later on, your children grow up. Your debt is down. Your mortgage is paid. You need retirement money. You don't need a life insurance policy. You need retirement money. If you got $500,000 at retirement, then you're self-insured. If something happens to you, you leave your family the money. So there's two risks that we have to protect ourselves from. Number one, dying too soon. That's life insurance. Number two, living too long. See, right now we got a lot of people outliving their money. And that's why they're financially in trouble. So please take advantage and, and learn how to do things. Another thing we need to learn how to do is debt, is get out of debt. We need to learn how to, and, and, and right now during this time period, <coughs> if you lost your job, I wanna give you a couple of things that you need to, uh, that I want you to do. Number one, the first thing is I want you to call your creditors. And I want you to ask your creditors what kind of leniency they are offering right now. If you lost your job and you have no other income, do not pay or don't use your stimulus check to pay your bills. You need to hold on to that money. They're talking about possible food shortages. We don't know if there's gonna be a second wave of, of, of Corona coming. They're talking about opening up the economy, but we don't know what's gonna happen. So if your income is, has been cut or is short, then you wanna start holding on to that money. If you've been flayed off, then you want to find out what your creditors are going to do. If you own a home, then make sure you look at the details of that furlough. I got clients calling me up. Some mortgage companies are saying, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll add it on to the back of the loan, right? But what they're saying is that we'll give you two months off. And then after those two months are over, then we expect those two months that you missed and the current month. So make sure you get the details. I called, <coughs> I, I just, just in preparation for this, I called one of my own uh, uh, credit card companies and I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing for uh, people who, who might be strugg uh, struggling right now financially? Are you, you have a leniency program right now? And, she, and they said, uh, yeah, we do. Um, we can enroll you in it and, you know, and, and see what happens. So she said, you want to go to the automated? I said, no, I don't want to go to the automated. Uh, I want you to read it to me. And I want you to read it to me nice and slow. So as she's reading, she's saying that although we're going to waive two months premium or two months, uh, two months of, well, of bills, we're still going to charge you interest. So what am I saying? Make sure you get something in writing. Make sure you understand what's happening. Don't just take, uh, yeah, uh, you got a customer service rep on the other side. Yeah, you won't have to pay. Yeah, but why? How do, how do the terms work? What's going to happen if I don't pay? Are they going to excuse the interest? Are they going to excuse any fees? Ask questions, okay? Um, so how do we get out of debt? 
we focus on one debt instead of spreading the extra money on all of them. We get rid of one. And then after we get rid of one, we drop the money we were paying on the first one down on the second one instead of paying 353, 573 till that one's gone, then drop the 573 on top of the third one till that's gone, so forth and so forth. Why? Because as human beings, we need to see progress. And if we don't see progress, then we get, um, what should I say, uh, discouraged. So what should we be thinking about? Number one, we think about uh, what, what's going on with our credit cards. And if you are not, if you are fortunate enough like myself to be essential and still be working, then you're not spending any money. You can't go out to, out to dinner. You can't go out to lunch, okay? So why don't you use all of that extra money and attack your debt right now? I'll give you another tip. We're not driving right now. So if you got two cars, uh, take one car and uh, call your uh, car insurance company and take them, tell them to take the car off for the time being. You, we ain't going nowhere. So call the other car. Tell them to take the one car off that uh, you don't need to drive right now and save that money until we get 100% open. See, there's two parts of your brain. You got the, uh, the the frontal lobe, and then you got this little tiny thing right here. <coughs> and I've been studying this thing because this is the thing that makes us act out of emotions. It's called the amygdala, the amygdala. And what the amygdala does, it, it, it's a, it makes us emotional, makes us either fight or flight, and there's nothing to matter, but when you flight out of the market at the wrong time, you're going to hurt yourself. So I want to focus on a couple of things that we want to make sure that we're not doing. Number one, anchoring, anchoring. When you anchor, you focus too heavily on one piece of information when you're making decisions. And we don't want to do that. So what happens is this. A client comes to me, they say, Kenny, we want to get 20, 10%. And then the market goes up 20%. And then they're like, well, I want to get 20% now. So what happens then if... Uh, somebody comes to me and they say, Kenny, I want to get 8%. And then the market goes up, right? Market goes up and it's higher than 8%. And then we have a crash, all right? And then they still are higher than 8%. But they start anchoring, okay, at that high number. And they forget about the original goal. They're still higher than what they originally wanted to get. So don't anchor, don't focus in on one thing. Keep the big picture, the big picture. Number two, loss aversion, okay? The pain we associate with loss is twice as much than the reward we feel when we gain. And what happens is that fear makes people do things that hurt them. So you look at the dot-com bust, we have $491 billion that went into money markets. During the global financial crisis, 943. But look what happens. When you look at the, mo the, the money that went into those money markets after inflation, okay, what they really did was lost money, negative 0.65. And the market inflation, rather, is 3%. So if your money doesn't at least keep up with inflation, if it doesn't at least keep up with inflation, then you're losing purchasing power. You're losing purchasing power. So how do we live with market volatility? We wanna stay calm, stay calm. The Bible says God has given us peace. He is a God of peace. Keep a long-term perspective. Remember that this is temporary. We've had these things before. All of these different things have happened. And we've still had solid returns, an average of 10%. Keep the big perspective, okay? Tune out the noise. Stop listening to the uh, radio every day. Stop focusing on your statements. It'll be all right. Look, <coughs> the number of daily gains, 54%. The number of daily losses, 46%. The number of monthly gains, 63. 
the number of monthly losses, 37. One year period losses, okay, or gains, 80%. Three year gains, 86. Five year gains, 90%. 10 year gains, 91. So what does that mean? The longer you keep your money in the market, then what happens? The more, the more uh, 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 probable that you're gonna uh, make money. So don't focus on the short term. Diversification matters. And then I'm gonna start bringing it in because I wanna do at least maybe 10 minutes of uh, 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 Q&A. Diversification matters. This is, the if you look at the top, the top line is the top performing asset class of each year from 05 to 2019. There, you never know. One year it might be emerging market stocks. Another year it might be bonds. Another year it might be small growth stocks. Another year it might be small value stocks. This is why we put our money in a, 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 a plethora of different asset classes. Because look, if you look at this right here, you'll see the ups and the downs. If you draw an arrow, you got Vs and Ws, up, down, up, down. And most people can't handle that. So we diversify. If you only bought one asset class, it'll be a roller coaster ride. So listen, winners rotate. You take total uh, uh, investment of $200,000, okay? And if you chase the winners, always invest in, in the previous year's best performing asset class, you'll average 6.99%. You invest with the losers, the worst asset class, you got 6.56%. But if you consistently invest across several asset classes, then you're going to get about uh, 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 almost uh, a half a point to a full point better. So what side are you on? See, one of the things that we talk about, we talk about diversifying our asset classes, which is very important, but we also need to diversify the way we make money. And part of the reason why so many people today, right now, going through this COVID are in trouble financially is because they are an expense. Business 101 says profit equals revenue minus expenses. And an employee is an expense. And that's why we got 27, so many people in trouble right now. The majority of them are employees. So just like you diversify your portfolio, you need to diversify the way you make money. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that next week uh, when we start because there's ways to make money and we need to make money in different ways. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes that we should have at least two ways of making money because we don't know which one is going to be the best way. So I'm going to stop right there, and um, I'm going to just open it up for a couple of questions. Um, my name, once again, is Elder Kenny. I am a fiduciary advisor. Um, I put together financial plans, and if you call and you let me know that you are on here, then we will do a free financial plan for you. My phone number is 973 four, six, four, six, three, seven, three. My email is Kenny Bryant 48 at gmail.com. If you have questions, if you are concerned, if you don't know what to do, if you are scared, then call me, call me. Um, Administrators, if you guys want to open it up for q and I'll take a couple questions. You can unmute. You can unmute yourself. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. Or you can put them in the chat. Yeah, the chat works. Mm-hmm. 
Once again, uh, phone number, Elder Kenny Bryant, 973-464-6373. Email, kennybryant48 at gmail.com. kennybryant48 at gmail.com. No questions? All Great right. Elder Kenny, this is Dr. Ben. Great presentation. Can I go ahead? Yes, you can. Okay, wonderful. I like what you said about um, shipped and <laughs> when you get your salary or your income or your monies, you nope, I thought about on ten percent. You pay yourself ten percent and uh, you live on the 80 um, percent. I practice that, but for the benefit of others. Wait a second, expand... wait a second. Dr. Ben, wait a second. Yes, yes Let me mute. Just give me a second. Let me mute everybody again and then just unmute you and Elder Kenny. Okay, so just give me one second because we're getting some interference. So hold on one second. And then moving forward, if anybody wants to speak, you can either raise your hand or put your question in the chat because it's not working for us to unmute everybody simultaneously because we have some background noise. So stand by. Now, Dr. Ben, I need your number. I don't see it. I can unmute. There you are, perfect. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me clearly? Is there still feedback? No, we can hear you. Okay, great. What I was saying, um, Elder Kenny, is that you spoke about the principle of um, 10, 10, and 80. Mm -hmm. I believe in that. But for the sake of others who have never heard that before, could you expound a little bit on, on that principle? Um, I, I really do agree with you that a lot of us are in trouble because we did not prepare adequately. We ate all our resources. Mm -hmm. Going forward, uh, for someone who wants to employ that, um, give an example as to how they could go forward with it. Okay. <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, let's say you make the uh, for, for, uh, $4,000 a month, okay? We know our tithes would be $400. So we're going to give God his $400. And then you're going to give you your $400, okay? And then that would be $800. And then you would live off the $3,200. Now, if you, one of the things that I've learned in my practice is that we take years to run our debt up and then all of a sudden we want to get up. We just want to eliminate. We want it gone. And it doesn't work like that. You have to work to get yourself out of debt. You might have to take a part-time job. I, you know, I used to tell my clients, I said, look, uh, take a part-time job, work hard for six months, then take three months off. And all the money that you made working a, a job, uh, 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 put that, that part-time job, put it on your debt and then take three months off and rest. And then you know what? Revive yourself and then go do it again. Okay? Because debt is what's stopping us. And a lot of people, it's not even debt. Because one of the first things I do is do a debt to income ratio. A debt to income ratio for every client I sit down with so I can know what their debt to income ratio. And your debt to income ratio, anything under 20, under 15% is considered excellent. So if your minimum, you and how do you figure this out? You take your min, you take your uh, income, and you multiply that by your minimum required debt payments. So just the minimum, and then you you uh, uh, you do, uh, divide one into other, and you got your debt to income ratio. Once you know your debt to income ratio, then I know if you have a spending problem or a debt problem, because most people that think they have debt problems. They don't have debt problems. What they really have is spending problems. People are eating lunch. They're eating dinner. They're eating up their future. 
and, and it's and it's and it's not godly because it's a lack of self control. So that is a way that you can do that. And maybe you can't start with ten percent right now. Maybe you have to start with two percent. But the point is, every single time you get paid, you need to pay you. You need to give you some money. You can't just pay all your bills and not pay you because you'll be in the predicament that a lot of people are in right now, okay? You have 60% of Americans that can't even, 60% of Americans can't deal with a $1,000 uh, emergency. And this is supposed to be the wealthiest country in the world. China saves, the average China resident saves over 30% of their income. We got to get better, okay, because we, we, we're heading in that cycle. And I said it earlier, I mean, we got, we start at what? Economic cycles. We got hard work and discipline, then abundance and comfort, and then indulgence. That's where we are right now, in indulgence. Then we got decay and destruction. And then we repeat. So we want to make sure that we are uh, not uh, going down that road. That's a great question, Dr. Ben. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, Elder Erica, would you read it, please? It's from Robert Fleming uh, concerning term and whole insurance. And do you mind talking a bit about the pros and cons of each? Okay, sure. All right. So that's a great question, Robert. So the re there's four reasons why I do not like cash value life insurance. Um, it basically started when I was a trainee and I was training with a gentleman from the principal financial group where I started my financial career. And um, at that particular time, I was an immigrations officer uh, full time and I was training with him part time. So I was taking him to see some of my immigration friends and fellow officers. And one day I took him to see one of my friends and my friend had a wife and two little daughters. And he offered him the product that he sold him was a $50,000 whole life policy. So after we left the house, I said, why didn't you even offer him a term policy, uh, 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 Robert? Because $50,000 is not gonna do anything for his family if God forbid something happened to him. And his answer was, Kenny, if you sell that stuff, you won't eat. That was his verbatim answer. So that automatically told me that he wasn't a person of integrity and he was just looking out for his own pocket. So there's four reasons. I call them the four evils of cash value life insurance. Number one, cash value life insurance, whole life, universal life, variable life is more expensive. Eight to 10 times more expensive than term. So we got people with $20,000 in coverage when they could have had $200,000 for the same money. And if you pass away and you leave your family, Robert, $20,000 after they pay for the funeral, they don't have nothing to live on. So number one, it's more expensive. Number two, although you buy it for two things, you buy it for insurance and you buy it for the cash, you never get both. So Let's say you have a $100,000 policy and you've paid your premiums for 25 years. You've generated $10,000 in the cash value. If you pass away, what does the insurance company promise to pay? They promise to pay the death benefit. What's the death benefit? The $100,000. So what happens to the $10,000? The insurance company keeps it. So in um, essence, they only put your family $90,000 out of their own pocket because they kept your 10000 Can we mute? Uh, uh, we think, I think we got Esther is unmuted. If we could, thank you. So in essence, what they did is they kept your $10,000. So really out of their pocket, they paid your family 90. So one of the reasons why these are sold is because it automatically reduces the insurance company's liability. And I don't think that's right. If you pay for two things, you're supposed to get two things. Number three, if you have $10,000, Robert, in your cash value, if you need that cash value, why can't you just withdraw it? Why do you have to borrow your own money, Robert? 
and pay the insurance company six to eight percent interest to get it. So if I said, Robert, put your money in my bank, and then when you need your money out of my bank, you got to come to me, you got to borrow your own money from me, and you got to pay me six to eight percent interest to get your own money. Now, I'm sure you're a smart man, Robert, and I don't think you would like that. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like that. And the fourth reason <coughs> is because now, now let me just even go, let me go into detail a little bit more. So let's say you, you borrow 5,000 of that 10,000 that you got in there. That leaves 5,000 in the cash value. Now you got to pay six to 8% interest to the insurance company, not to you, to the insurance company. Okay. On that $5,000 that you borrow. Now, if you borrowing from your insurance policy, is it fair to assume that you could be having financial problems? Yes. So paying that extra interest could be challenging. And if that you don't pay that interest, it creeps up on your policy. And guess what creeps down, Robert? Your death benefit. I've seen people who had $25,000 policies couldn't even remember when they took a loan. We had parishioners in our church in Jesus is coming that this happened to. And when they passed away, those policies were worth four or $5,000 because the interest that ate it all up. And the last evil that I, I, I reason why I don't like the cash value policies are, is because um, they get very low rates of return. Anywhere from one to 4%, you take the rule of 72, 72 divided by four means your money's gonna double every 18 years, which is still too long. So what do I believe in? What do I do for my own, my own self, for my own family? I believe in a concept called split funding. Split funding, where you separate your entities. You buy term insurance on one side because it's cheaper, you can protect your family, and you invest the difference, the money that you would save, okay? Okay, then you what? You invest the difference in, in a Roth IRA. Why? Because a Roth IRA can be invested in mutual funds. You can get a higher rate of return. With a Roth IRA, if you ever get in trouble financially and you need your contributions, you can take them out tax-free, penalty-free, anytime without having to borrow your own money. Number three, <coughs> if something happens to you while the uh, term policy is still in force, your family gets the term policy money and they get the Roth IRA money. So they actually get both two things. And one of the questions people ask is, well, Kenny, what happens when the, uh, when the uh, term life policy, uh, when the original term is up? I'm like, great, great question. When, well, if we take the difference and we invest the difference, then you're gonna have a lump sum of money, okay? So if I have you two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in your mutual fund, when your term policy is up, then you don't need life insurance anymore because you're self-insured. If something happens, you leave your family what? The money. I have no really, I have really no need for life insurance right now. My children are all out the house. They're all grown. My house is just about paid and I got some coin. If something happened to me, once he will be good. But I still keep a significant amount of insurance on myself because I want the next generation to get a leg up. See, I believe that we, our children, our grandchildren should lift off from where we left off. And we don't give our, we don't even give them a, a, a handshake. We don't get, we a, a good, see you later. No, that's not God's will. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So are we good people or are we not? I've seen people get destroyed, Robert, from cash value policies, man. I've never seen not one single person get hurt that employed the split funding concept. Now, have I seen people buy term insurance and not take the difference and not save it? And then when that term was up, then that term went up? Absolutely. But that's not because the philosophy or the strategy doesn't work. That's because they refuse to employ the strategy. And that's a great question. Uh, we have a few more questions. Keep them so coming. Have, I'm, hot. I'm rolling. Okay, great. So we have um, 
Some people may not know the difference between a bull and a bear market. Please elaborate. And then we have a question right after that. So okay. um, a bull market, a bull market is when prices, prices, stock prices go up over 20%. Um, and a bear market is when they go down uh, 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 minus 20%. <coughs> uh, okay, next question. Is you got the oil one? Um, you, go ahead. Go ahead, Elder. Uh, is it smart right now to invest in oil? That's a, so. Um, I don't like answering those general questions because if I answer that question, if I say yes, then there's a bunch of people that might run out and buy oil, and without me knowing their their situation. So, for example, do they have an emergency fund in place? Um, if do they have short-term savings in place? Are they are they okay for retirement right now? Um, are, are, is oil down? Absolutely, oil is down. Oil is down. But before I attend, the commodities market is a very tricky market. Okay, so before I just say yes, I, what I what I what I'll say is that oil is down. Oil is down, so it's lower. So, but without knowing somebody's full financial picture, I don't want to say it's smart to go buy oil right now because I don't know where they are. I don't know where their debt situation is. I don't know all of that because even though oil is down, it still might be not, not by, blah, blah, might not be the best thing for them to do right now. Okay. Uh what kind of insurance is available and do you recommend for someone 57 years old and disabled? <coughs> um, is the disability, it, it would depend on how serious the disability is. If they're disabled and they're on fixed income, then, and, they, and nobody's dependent on their income, the cheapest way to go is always gonna be term insurance. The cheapest way to go. Now, de depending on how healthy they are, they might have to, and if nobody's dependent on their income, and 57 is still relatively, you know, young, they could, you, you know, live another 25 years, um, there's a possibility that, that I might recommend a cash value policy, depending on who, you know, how old they are, how much premium they have, but term life insurance is always the best way to go unless you can't get covered. If you can't get covered because of the disability, then I might, you know, I might recommend, but that's, once again, that's a case by case scenario, case by case. Uh, next question concerning, uh, if you have $10,000 sitting in your checking account uh, right now, what would be a good thing to do with it to help it grow? All right, so I, uh, I would probably, you know, start with a nice equity, equity mutual fund um, and, get, and get your feet wet before, you know, going a little bit more into advanced things because that money's been sitting in a uh, checking account. So I'm assuming that this person has no investment knowledge right now. So I think a nice place to start with is an equity is a nice equity mutual fund. Um, if you call me or email me, then uh, uh, we can uh, you know we can talk about something that is a good fit for you um, because it's definitely it's, it's losing money in the bank. It's losing money. The bank is not giving you one percent. Inflation is doing three percent. So you're losing money with that money right there. But I would caution because. I would like to know, do you have an emergency fund? If something happened, could you pay, you know, could you, if you got laid off, could you, you know, you have three months worth of income to the side. These are things that are, that, that are kind of important as well. Okay. So, but a nice equity fund, a nice portfolio, a couple of funds, uh, maybe, you know, depending on your age, maybe a couple of bonds in there too. Um, so a nice little portfolio with $10,000, we could put a nice, portfolio together for you. Please talk about dollar cost averaging. That's a great question. Um, that's actually later on in my presentation. I'm going to cover dollar cost averaging next week. Okay. So I just didn't get to that tonight. 
Um, but that's all that is in the presentation. So uh, to, if you come back next week, I'm going to go heavy into dollar cost averaging. Uh, there's one more here on this one, and then we have to go back to Janet Dart from the live. Um, does it make sense to pay off an eight-year-old debt? So what, what, I, I need a little bit more information. The, the Bible always tells us to uh, pay our debt. So um, what do they mean? Give me a little bit more. Does it make sense to pay off the eight-year-old debt? I would have to. I'll, I'll go back to the person while we're answering. Okay, and uh, I saw another one. I think I think uh, I, I saw another one about what happens with term insurance when you're 80 or something like that. So um, a person that has term life insurance, a, a, a reputable company like the companies that I represent, you have guaranteed renewability. Okay, so you have guaranteed renewability. But think about it: if you have if you have raised your children, your children are out the house. You've paid your house off and you've invested and you have a little money at 80 you shouldn't really need any insurance if you need some insurance let's say you bought a 20-year term at age 60 and now you're 80 years old then you can renew that policy now it'll be a little bit if you keep the same coverage it's going to be a little bit more expensive okay because you had the uh because you uh are 20 years older but if you took that same money and you invested that money, the difference between what the whole life policy and the term policy cost, then you would have a lot more money and it would be cash that you can use for whatever you want to use it for. You can't use an insurance policy to retire off of. You can't do it. Did the person give you that little bit extra information about that eight-year-old debt? Yeah, it's an eight-year-old debt sitting on the credit report. Has it been charged off? Uh, it's still sitting there, probably. So it's not. It's probably not charged off yet. How long? How long has it been sitting there? Uh, let me get that for you. But we also, I, so what, yeah. if it's been charged off? If it's been charged off, the damage has already been done to the credit report. Okay. So, you know, so maybe I wouldn't. Um, if it hasn't been charged off. And, and I have the ability to pay it, then I probably would pay it because the Bible says, do not withhold from those that you owe when you have the ability to pay. So, uh, I mean, we got to stop looking for something for nothing. You know, Bible says, obey the laws of the land. If you got the resources to pay something then pay it, if you don't have the resources to pay it, then that's what bankruptcy is for. That's what some of those other laws of the land are for. So obey those laws as well. That's a good question. Um, I, think, I think we're at the end of our questions. Are we, Eld Erica? I think there's one more from Janet Dodd from the Facebook Live. Can you pull uh, that? I think that we got. The, you got her. Okay. Did we answer the? Oh, okay. what time and day is the pre presentation next week? Same okay. time. Same time. Okay. So right. So can you guys see that on the screen? It's May fifth. 7.30 p.m. on Zoom at this meeting ID, which is 973-375-8500. It's at the bottom of the screen. Or you can also dial in. That information is also at the bottom of the screen. This will go up in the DJICC Facebook group. And if you have joined the DJICC mailing list, you'll get this in an email. Or if you join Elder Kenny's mailing list, by going to managingmoneygodsway.net and joining, uh, you'll get this in an email as well. So, so I want to end. Um, and then, am I taking? Uh, then am I taking off and doing everything? Or yes, somebody? sir. Please okay. do. All right. So, a couple things I, I like to end tonight, tonight with. The Bible says the hand not overnight. It's not overnight because God has to build character. Wait, say that again. You went out. I went out. Okay. <laughs> the Bible says. The Bible says the hand of the diligent make it rich. Amen. Uh, uh, everyone that is hasty, it leads surely to poverty. So we have to, we have to practice 
some strategies consistently and not and, and not always be looking for a home run or a get rich quick strategy okay dollar cost averaging which whoever brought that up that is a, a beautiful strategy i'm going to go over that next week but I, I want people to understand that god is in the character building business he wants us he wants to build our character as he builds our wealth because as as has happened so many times if you get wealth without any character without any self-control then you're gonna blow it which has happened to i don't i don't know how many thousands of people who have hit the lottery who have gotten inheritances and just blown the money just like that because they had no self-control and no integrity so god is going to build your character as your character is being built okay he can trust you with more money okay um i also want to give uh 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 an opportunity to sow into our ministry uh delivers jesus is coming with our overseer and our senior pastor vanessa ever is uh, uh, is good ground is good ground. we believe in helping the community we believe in in teaching what the bible says we believe in growing people growing people as a whole and we feel we uh, this is a good ground so we ask you out there if you have uh gotten something if you have received something tonight that's been a blessing to you we ask you to sow into the ministry sow into the ministry make a a, a gift god will honor you god will honor you we can't beat god's giving and last but not least <coughs> the most important thing is not our money we are temporary visitors on this planet one day we're all going to leave here whether we leave here through death or we leave here through the coming of christ through the rapture and you could have millions and millions of dollars but you know what you can't take it with you you can't take it with you and your millions that you have here is nothing compared to the poorest house that's going to be in heaven the, the slightest bank account that's going to be in heaven and i just want to suggest to you very strongly if you do not know jesus christ as your lord and personal savior see there's a peace there's a peace that comes with knowing that you're that this ain't it this is this is not it this is not the end this is temporary and there's a peace that comes with this when the market goes down and i got a lot of money in the market but there's a peace there's a peace because i know that i'm going home one day so if you have not accepted christ as your personal savior that is the best decision you can make over money over investing over getting out of debt you name it so i invite you if you have not accepted christ as your personal savior what does that mean to accept him as your personal savior it just means that you have you understand that you are human and that you are flawed and that you are not capable of running your own life as effectively as god is and we submit our will to his will and we follow his will for our lives because he is the alpha and the omega he knows everything he created you and he he put a strategy together so that you could have eternal life. When Adam, when Adam sinned, he broke fellowship with God. But Jesus Christ came and he paid the sin debt for my life and for your life so that we could be restored in the relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's a gift that all you have to do is receive. The price has already been paid. And if you would just pay this, pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for my life. I thank you for creating me. I ask that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me for all I've ever done wrong, knowingly and unknowingly. I yield my life to you. 
I submit to you. I give you my life. Thank you for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that simple prayer with me right now, I want you to give you a couple of things. Number one, get connected with a, a, a good Bible teaching church. I recommend this church because we teach the Bible. Uh, uh, begin to read your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, 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 go on uh, Amazon and order a Bible. You might want to order the Message Bible. It's a little easier to understand, um, something like that. Uh, so you can get the understanding of what the Bible is teaching. I, I pray every day. And it doesn't have to be a big elaborate prayer. Just talk to God like you're talking to your friend. Talk to him like you're talking to your girlfriends. Fellas, talk to him like you're talking to your boys. And then as you make an effort to get to know God, the Bible says he's going to come looking for you. He's going to... He's gonna, he says, you're going to find me when you seek me. And as you get to know him, you're going to recognize the promises that he has for you and what he wants to do in your life. I want to thank everybody. I look forward to seeing you next week. I ask you to bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you because I'm going to go into some meat next week. I thank everyone for getting on. Wincy, did you uh, post how they can give, the different ways that they can give? Yes, it's there. Can you all see it on the screen? I can't see it. It's there. Okay. They can see it. Yeah. Okay, okay yes. great. All right. Love you all. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see everyone next week. God bless you. Bless you all. Thank you. Bless you all. Peace and blessings to all. Thank you. Great seeing you guys. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Amen. Amen. God bless. Love you all. Bless y'all. Love y'all. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.